G'day and welcome to Reading Mission, a live book club podcast where we read some of our favourite books about mission, justice and social change together. My name is Mitch and with me tonight is Emily. Hello, how's it going? I would just like to start by um, respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters of Australia and pay respects to elders past and present and we recognise their continuing connections to land, water and culture. So Mitch, what are we reading this this time within the book club? Yeah, we are kicking off reading mission with Make Poverty Personal by Ash Barker. This is a bit of a classic. Um, I've had this book on my shelf since 2010. It was first published in 2006, and the edition we're reading from was uh, republished in 2019. Um, And tonight we are reading through the forward, the introduction, and the first chapter. So we've got a bit to get through and uh, excited to get stuck in. But before we do that, Emily... What's a highlight from your last week or so being? Well, considering I'm in the state of New South Wales, we've had our so-called Freedom Day. I'm using inverted commas for you those that are just listening to this. (laughs) Um, So that's kind of fun. Not that I've really done anything yet, but it's just kind of interesting to be at that place. Mm. Um, I also went for an awesome bush walk with a friend on Saturday down to the the Gross River. (laughs) Um, and it was quite the trek down. Well, the trek down wasn't too bad. It was coming up. That was a bit of a, bit of a hike out. Um, it was a good, like 8k walk, but it was absolutely spectacular. So it was pretty good. Definitely. We'll definitely be going back through more in summer as well. What about you? Yeah. So I got my second AstraZeneca shot on Friday. That is not my highlight because I'm definitely (laughs) afraid of needles. Um, and my wife. I saw you did get a nice lollipop, though. I did get a nice lollipop because I knew. Did you have to buy that and then she just handed it to you, or like she she (laughs) bought it for me? My my wife was a pharmacist who administered uh, the vaccine for me, which was uh, about as traumatic for her as it was for me. But because (laughs) I am now fully vaccinated, I was able to go on a lovely outdoor picnic with some friends and catch up with them and. In particular, catch up with their kids, which um, oh, nice. it's absolutely been one of the hardest things about uh, being in lockdown in Melbourne these last two years, almost uh, not getting a, a, not getting to hang out with my favourite small people because mm. they are not as confident on Zoom as their parents. Because um, I'm talking, you know, one and a half and two or three <laughs> kind of thing. They're not yeah. the users, users, not but yet. Uh, just you not yet. <laughs> so I got the uh, the one and a half year old, the two year old. I can't remember how old he is. That he uh, fell asleep on my shoulder, and so I was, oh. just, I was I was in my happy place. Yeah, that's so precious when that happens because you're like, oh, ultimate trust. <laughs> yeah, it's just nice. That's very special. This is after I was throwing him around in a milk crate, but. Uh, Oh, look, (laughs) it all comes with the gig, really, doesn't it? (laughs) So, Emily, speaking of children, what are your thoughts on God rescuing a whole bunch of children and their families from slavery in Egypt? What a beautiful segue, Mitch. (laughs) Uh, I've been sitting on that one for most of the day. (laughs) Oh, you knew it was going to come and you thought, let's, this is going to be the one. Prepared it in advance. Um, Never have I heard a smoother segue. Yeah. Uh, no, well, I think, you know, slaving, slaving, saving people from slavery, it's a bit of a tongue twister, um, <laughs> good thing, um, especially when people have been oppressed for significant periods of time and getting out of oppression is a good thing, obviously. It's really great that you think that because that is going to make reading today's chapter so much easier for you. Oh, phew. <laughs> phew, I'm so glad. Just try not to hit the mic as I talk with my hands. (laughs) (laughs) So the way we think this is going to work. So obviously this is our first episode. We haven't done this before. We're uh, building this particular plane as we're flying it. Um, But the way we figure it's going to work is that we will, each time we record, we will come together and uh, read a chapter of this book. um, And at the top, I'll give you a bit of a summary about what the chapter is about, just in case you haven't read it. And we'll work our way through pausing on highlights, we'll try and tease some stuff out and um, chat about the things that stand out to us and go on a bit of a deeper dive on the stuff that, uh, you know, catches our attention. Um, And if you're listening along in the Discord, feel free to chuck stuff, uh, your questions, your comments in the chat, and, um, yeah, we're keen to engage with those 
as they come up. So to kick us off, we have a forward from Shane Claiborne. So some people might know Shane from uh, books like The Irresistible Revolution or Jesus for President. Um, he, around the time that this was coming out, was another really big name in urban missiology. Um, and yeah, his forward is uh, a really good summary of the core themes of the book that we're going to explore together. Um, Justice is justice for the poor is a core tenet of Christianity. Uh, the gospel is for here and now, not just life in the thereafter. And making poverty personal means building real relationships with people experiencing poverty, not just advocating for them as an abstract, uh, you know, interest group or something like that. So, Emily, what stood out to you from this forward? Uh, well, one of the things that I highlighted, actually, so I read the forward quite a number of months ago. So the thing that stood out to me when I read it was um, sort of what you're talking about already. So, you know, um, the quote was, a Christianity that is about love, people um, loving people out of the hells of the world, not just trying mm. to scare them into heaven. Yeah. So I just really like that because it's yeah. so, um, I don't know, visual and yeah. where trying to bring people along on a journey and it's not just about, you know, mm. do this so you can get to heaven. So it's about the self. Mm. Um, it's mm. about mm. looking out or faith is about more than the self, which I think we can kind of get caught up in sometimes. It, it's about my yeah. salvation and me and my relationship with Jesus. But yeah. like thinking about the overflow of that relationship of, with Jesus and what does that mean for how you live going out and being in the world and sort of mm. that being in the world but not of the world and, mm. you know, working mm. and living in those grey areas that sometimes that you, like, have to kind of wrestle through. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That same thing really stood out to me. Um, uh, one of the things that absolutely gets my goat is um, the 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 individualization and the the um, the exclusive personalization of of Christianity. Um, it can get very um, you know, and this this is uh, sort of an an unhealthy expression of a very healthy uh, understanding of you know salvation by grace. You know, this you know Jesus is personally invested in my you know individual well-being and salvation um but that doesn't make you know that that doesn't divorce me from the world and mm. you know, the context is so you know i'm not saved just so i can uh you know uh, uh, punch my ticket to heaven, which is actually something that um, a friend of mine wrote on my baptism card uh, when <laughs> I was when I was baptized very long time. You know, you booked your ticket in heaven, time to party, which was lovely, a lovely sentiment. And yeah, you know, not right, wrong, really. So yeah, but that's not the that's not the gospel. The gospel yeah. is well, that's uh, not the whole much, gospel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much yeah. larger. You know, are we are we saved from um? From from sin into heaven, or from sin into right relationship with mm. God, with the world, with people around us. Um, yeah, you know how does how does salvation? How how are our economic systems experiencing salvation? How are our workplaces experiencing salvation? How are our schools? Yeah, it's and I guess that's where that grace comes in as well, because it's not mm. just grace for the self, but it's mm. then learning to be grace build and living out of that to, place yeah. to then yeah. build to those relationships Christian. and to be, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. To then, yeah, build that and to tr figure out what it means to rebuild those right relationships or create right relationships yeah. for yourself with yeah. the world, like with creation, with God and with people. Like, yeah. And what does that look like? And how does that look in your own context even? Because mm. like, I think something when we think about mission or sometimes, especially if you've grown up in the church, mission is this like big distant thing yep. um, across the other side of the world, which in some context mm. it is, but that's not all of mission either. Yep. Like mission is like you're a missionary wherever God has you right mm. now. So mm. like um, it's your school, it's yep. your youth group, yep. it's yep. your University. uni course, your uni yep. mates. Like yep. I don't know, maybe you've got kids, it's the it's hanging out every afternoon picking your kids up from school yeah. with the other parents that are there and like 
doing life with other people as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. one one of the first things I, I highlighted um, in this forward is, um, yeah, Ash's stories point us, oh, quote, Ash's stories point us towards a new kind of Christianity for which the world longs, a Christianity that looks like Jesus and whose gospel is actually good news to the poor, end quote. And I, I think that, you know, a Christianity that looks like Jesus um, is, yeah, just really amazing. And, like, Jesus was, a, a, is, or is, was, Jesus in the text is a hands-on, present, um, physical, dusty, you know, um, help meeting people where they are, helping them, mm. not not expecting much in return, if anything. Um, mm. Spending three years traveling with this this group of people, ragtag um, bunch, this of ragtag lads. bunch of people, um, only for them to completely not get it by the end. Even, <laughs> well, and still, I don't think about like, look, I've been doing it more than three years, and I don't think I really get it either. So. <laughs> Fair cool, boys. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And so, you know, for our for our Christianity, for our our um, our Christians, our, our little Christs, to look more and more like Jesus mm-hmm. um, is is really inspiring, but also really challenging because I think there's a lot of the time that we we, we don't. Yeah, um, I think we we look we look flashy, or we look um, you know we like our, our we're organizationally focused or, you know, all this stuff where, yeah, we're professional. Um, yeah. And no one in the ra- even, in that ragtag, those ragtag lads was professional. Yeah. And it's not even just like looking professional and stuff, but it's also like the way we present stuff sometimes, like the mm. gospel is offensive and the gospel is challenging and like the Bible does get you out of your comfort zone. Um, and it's not something that is clear or easy to understand yeah. or like any of that um and sometimes i don't know we can simplify it or construct like construct things in a way that make us feel good but and i mean sometimes that is important too but like jesus was a middle eastern jewish man from israel and was an advocate and was like yeah. someone who didn't get always get on with like the teacher the law or the people in yeah. power and stuff yeah. as well yeah yeah that this is a, again from the from the end of the forward quote um that's not the message of the televangelists and prosperity preachers but that is the gospel that rises from the ghettos from a homeless baby with no place to lay his head from the slums of bangkok and galilee from which people say nothing good can come and mm. quote I, I love that. Oh, yeah, this Shane's picked up one of my favourite um, little throwaway lines in the in the Gospels. Um, I'm pretty sure it's from John, where um, it'd be it'd be Andrew, wouldn't it? Um, says, you know, here's here's that you know, um, we've met Jesus. Come and hear what he's about. He's from he's from Nazareth, and his immediate response is, "Can anything good come from Nazareth? <laughs> like, it's like from oof. that dump? Yeah." <laughs> From that, from that hick backwater? Yeah, and it's funny because, like, I mean, we can probably all picture the places in the places where we grew up or the towns mm. and the neighbourhoods mm. that are those places mm. that seem to be the backwater or it's sort of not as affluent or anything like that. And you go, that's where Jesus came from. Yeah, yeah. And that's and where he towns, was. Yeah, whole towns and locations. Like, I don't know about a few, but can anything good come from Ringwood train station? <laughs> where the where the teenagers hang out after school and yeah can anything good come from there yeah um can anything good come from um broad meadows yeah um yeah well, arguably yeah. you could say like blacktown or the druid and yeah. it's like well so obviously good things can't come from those places but yeah you know that's they're the stereotypes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And those are those are the places where jesus lived and breathed and taught mm. and um those are the places that we are called into and good things are called out of mm. um i'll just I'll, I'll wrap us up with this other one that uh, other quote that i 
highlighted. Quote, Ash Barker is one of those prophetic voices. Sorry, let me try that again. Ash Barker is one of the prophetic voices in the wilderness, calling people out of the centers of power and privilege to meet God on the margins. Mm. End quote. So I think that, that sets us up really nicely for what this, uh, what this book is trying to do. So, so mm. massive thanks to, to Shane for introducing us so nicely. Um, let's move along to the uh, actual start of the book, but, before we do that, just a little bit of, of background and context about um, Ash and Urban Neighbors of Hope. Um, so the context that this book was written out of um, is the the Urban Neighbors of Hope movement, which Ash was a um, you know a founding voice in the sort of an urban missionary movement that um, has really strong ties with the Churches of Christ um, and has had a number of expressions uh, throughout the years, but the sort of particularly notable ones, Ash and his family moved to Thailand into one of the largest slums, um, certainly in Thailand, I think possibly in the world, um, Klong Toy, which is a real, like the, you know, know, we were talking about can anything good come from Ringwood Station and, um, you know, can anything good come from Klong Toy? Um, is just an absolute that um, so much poverty, so much you know, densely packed people, no infrastructure, you know, running water is not a guarantee, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff, and so that's the context that um, Ash moved his family into, and they lived for a number of years just being neighbors. Um, they did all sorts of stuff in that context, you know, supporting schools, supporting, um, you know, after school programs, supporting that kind of thing. But their, their primary thing, their whole point of urban neighbors of hope is to just be present and to be a neighbor and to be sensitive and responsive to where God is calling their attention and stepping into those spaces, just help in ways that neighbours do, not in the ways that NGOs do, not in the ways that governments do. Those things are great and uh, necessary, but the Urban Neighbours of Hope crew, the UNO crew, they're there to be neighbours. So it's from that context that a lot of Ash's uh, thinking and his, his writing, particularly of this book, emerges out of. Um, so we'll skip over the, the preface, um, which you know, is, is good context and good part of the story, except to, we'll, but we'll skip it over, skip over it, except to highlight, uh, for all of the GMP, uh, people who know the, our organization, uh, there's a couple of familiar names in there in particular, uh, our mate, Nick White contributed to the first edition of this book, uh, doing a bit of layout and design. So shout outs to Nick. Well done. Um, and now we'll start to tackle the introduction. So our introduction opens with a parable about a, um, man named Saw, who is a laborer making rugs and, um, he's, yeah, uh, Ash uses him as sort of a, an illustration of the kinds of impacts that uh, poverty can have. And Saw is uh, pro- look, probably dying, uh, overworked, desperate to sh- be able to send money home to his family, but um, is wasting away. Uh, and Saw uh, uses his uh, position as a labourer in a rug manufacturing factory to weave a message into a rug that then travels to um, another country and is bought by a, a more affluent family. And the message he sneaks into that rug is, please stand with me. Ash then goes on to talk about how the Bible is oriented towards justice for the poor with over 2,000 verses directly talking about poverty and um, you know, economic justice. Um, but somehow this is something that is often missed in the Western church. Um, he also points out that we as a world have the material means to end poverty, but it's going to take a reckoning with the deeper social and spiritual dimensions of poverty. And it's going to require a response to a lack 
and a response to excess in order to move us um, out of a global situation of poverty. So, Emily, what stood out to you from this introduction? Oh, that first like parable analogy, mm. oof, it just kind of hits because mm. um, it's definitely one of those things where it's like check your privilege a little bit. Um, that's how I found it anyway, just in terms of like, you know, um, you know, the family that are like, oh, it doesn't quite match our like aesthetic yeah. or that kind of thing. Oh, we'll just put it on the floor somewhere. It's like, oh, yeah. um, and it's interesting because I was sort of having a conversation with a friend the other day just about like some different like privileged things. So it was, we were talking about the vaccine and I was sort of, you know, holding out for an AstraZeneca, oh, sorry, holding out for a Pfizer and different things. And it was like, you know, and I said, look, you know, I've got to check my privilege sometimes because like I've got the <laughs> means and things to be able to do that. But if I was living anywhere else in the world, I would be happy yeah. to get what I can get based yeah. on that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, that kind of thing always sort of is, I find really important to just sort of check in with my privilege um, and acknowledge that it is there and that's my positionality when I come into these spaces. And I think that's important as well in the context of like the whole missional framework and understanding of this and even the whole context of this book. You know, we come from a position, like we you may or may not, but we all come from a different position and place and to acknowledge where you come from and what, how that plays into who you are and um, your perspective and worldview um, influences how you interact with scripture, how you interact with other people. Mm. Um, and it's really important to take knowledge of that and the things that make you uncomfortable and the things that, you know, make sense and don't make sense and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that was just one of those humbling moments of like check in with where you're at kind of stuff. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that story of, of Saw is going to come back again and again through the text um, in the in this form of the, there's this, this key idea through the whole book um, that I've highlighted because it's just it really it really hit me this time reading it. Um, the Bible, quote, the Bible is like a precious weaving made by God through oppressed people, end quote. And so that that is going to keep coming up again and again as we read the book. The Bible that we read, the Bible that, you know, is is one of the, the cornerstones of um, the Christian faith is something that is made by poor people out of the experience of poverty. The, the writers of the text, uh, you know, the, these are at best, like at their, at their most socially um, elevated, are uh, people who are still part of a oppressed minority pe- group, a, mm. um, a country that has lived under empire. Um, yeah. Um, the stories that we read are so often the stories of people who are experiencing poverty, who are living in um, circumstances where they're not able to make their own decisions and they are wrestling with circumstance and with external powers to be able to make their lives better, to make their lives heard. Um, So something that uh, Ash does pretty early on is um, puts a little bit of a definition around um, poverty. And this is something that's really important to keep in mind because he, he talks about um, like poverty is a, there is a material poverty where you don't have enough money. You need X amount of money in a day to be able to buy food, house your family, clean, do whatever else. And you don't have that. That's poverty. Um, Hmm. That is absolutely, you know, really accurate. There's also this aspect of poverty that we've talked about a bit um, with Safe Water September of poverty being a lack of choice, a lack of agency, and a lack of control over your own life. And that goes much deeper than um, you know a, a material poverty because that that starts to have really um, profound impacts on you know 
mental well-being, uh, confidence, skills, mm. you know, things like access to, to education. The two things that, you know, the material poverty and the, um, you know, the lack of agency and control are really closely tied yeah. to one another. And that's uh, what we call the poverty cycle as well, is mm. you get people and different groups and people and individuals can get caught generationally in these cycles because mm. of lack of control, lack of choice, lack of agency, mm. which then leads to, you know, um, inability to afford housing, to afford um, clean water, to lack of access to education, which then just perpetuates these cycles. Mm. And that's sort of what he's talking about here is that breaking that cycle and mm. breaking that chain. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. And something that I found really helpful in the way he describes that is he talks about this being a, um, you know, a, a, a damage to the image of God that is mm. in each of us. Each of us may, is made um, in the image of God, not in our, our physicality, obviously, because God doesn't have a face like mine um, or a beard like mine. But there is something in me that is modelled after who God is, um, and poverty poverty damages that, mars that, mm. obscures that in the ways that it it prevents people from flourishing. It prevents that fullness of life that God desires for all of God's creation, um, and. Yeah, so I, I I was curious, Emily, you because you're from, from a much more formal uh, development background than I am. Mm -hmm. um, Ash talks about the Millennium Development Goals, which were put in place uh, by the. Uh, I should I should remember this because we talked about this we on did the uh, episode on Mission this. Unplugged podcast. <laughs> uh, so this is this is my test. Yeah, how much did you remember of my lecture that I gave you? <laughs> <laughs> how engaging. <laughs> um, so the Millennium Development Goals were put in place by the United Nations to try and measure yeah. a, a global response to poverty, mm -hmm. you know, identifying key areas that we need to address to be able to break these cycles of poverty in countries around the world and sort of articulate some of the ways that we'd go about doing that and also provide a framework for um, organisations to get really involved and um, help out that process without, you know, stepping on each other's toes and tripping yes. over each other. Um, Ash's, Ash's statement is that the, the Millennium Development Goals aren't enough, um, which is you know, clearly not Ash taking a, uh, a massive run up and lunge at the uh, United Nations, but it is an acknowledgement that there is you know, a more complex reality. What were your thoughts about that as someone who has spent a lot more time than me dwelling in those frameworks and those approaches? Look, I think that's very valid to say and probably agree because none of these frameworks are perfect and can capture absolutely everything. So um, it was interesting because he's like um, the fact that, you know, the Millennium Develop needs Development Goals need to be revisited and stuff. And obviously in 2015 there were, which became oh, yeah. Sustainable Development Goals, yeah. uh, which became more complex and more diverse in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Um, um, but like, these are all human systems and while like very important and good, give us things to aim for, they're not going to be perfect because we are innately flawed and imperfect. So there's no like perfect solution to poverty, to any of these things. Like, this is just my, this is my opinion. Yeah, um, and like, it's important we have these things and these goals, um, because they give us something to work towards and a framework to work within as well. But because we are in innately flawed and imperfect, it's not going to be perfect. And, um, you know, poverty has to do with, you know, the fall and the imperfection and sin as well, right? Like, and no one deserves to be in poverty because yeah. sin. it's definitely not, that is not what I'm saying at all. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's a ramification that, of yeah. some of these structures that have been put in place for, different reasons and therefore like until jesus returns i don't think there's going to be perfection in the world and there's going to be pain and there's going to be suffering but it's what we can do to be those 
cry, mm. to be Christ-like in those situations, like we were talking about the start, to help bring people out. Well, it's not even helping bring people out of that because it's, that's very like paternalistic in terms of like, yeah. oh, it's our job to look. No, yeah, it's no. getting alongside. Like it's to being in the right pit with people. Yeah, yeah returning to that right. Yeah. Jumping in the pit with people and walking alongside them and climbing yeah. out together rather than yeah. like let's pull you out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Because that's not our job either. And that's <laughs> that's the incarnation. That's um mm. you know, God God became a human being in Jesus. And that's that's what the incarnation is: is to to live and to dwell among the people, in the mess, mm. um, yeah. in the muck and in the crap, and yeah, you know, to be set for, apart for and Jesus. then to walk alongside, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Jesus goes all all the way to to death on a cross mm. uh, in in his experience of that, um, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So that's that's the introduction. Nothing further to do. Let's jump into chapter one, Beyond Excuses, Moses, the Exodus, and Courage to Face the Nature of Poverty. So in this chapter, Ash introduces us to a God who takes the side of the oppressed using the story of Moses and the Exodus from Egypt. The saving activity of the Exodus forms the background to an examination of the character of God and Moses' excuses to avoid taking on the role that God has prepared for him. So there are five questions posed by Moses to God that Ash picks up um, in this chapter. Who, me? Who are you really, Lord? What will people think? What skills do I really have? And can't someone else do it? And in the course of that, Ash also talks about the, uh, he uh, identifies nine Hebrew words that are translated as oppression. Um, and ultimately leaves us with the question, how do our excuses prevent us from having the courage to contribute to changing the world? So, just, yeah. just light, light, easy topics to uh, light cover. And easy topics. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, like just in the context of the whole story of Moses, I yeah. do really like it as a whole story, 10 out of 10. Um, glad it's in the Bible. Um, <laughs> but, no, I just I, lo- I always love the way that, like, this small child from being a baby has been set apart um, yeah. to lead God's people. And one of those things of, like, he doesn't think he's got it, but we look back and read these stories and this history in hindsight and go, oh, yeah, like, he's been anointed and he's been prepared for this, like, his whole life. Mm. The really interesting thing that I had not looked at this story from this perspective was the perspective Mm. of the Israelite or the, um, yeah, the Israelite slaves in Egypt. And like, you know, for them, it's that same deal. It's that like person looking from the, if you were a slave looking from the outside, looking into seeing Moses talking to this burning bush and he's being like, but, but surely not, surely it's not me. Like it's got to be someone else. But like, I could imagine being that person being like, dude, He's talking to you. He's right there. <laughs> Come on. It's a bush on fire talking to you about leading people out of Egypt. If this what is more the God, want, what more? What more sign do you need? Yeah. <laughs> and I just, I, mean, I, lo- I really liked that because so often we read this from the Moses perspective, yeah. but like having that bird's eye from a different perspective is really fascinating. Yeah. So I encourage everyone to go and read the start of Exodus. Yeah. Well, sort of like chapter, I don't know, 13 or three from like chapter three on and read it from a perspective of someone who is in slavery at the same time as Moses. This has happened to Moses because it really like changes your perspective on the story. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you heard the, the story of, of Henry that Ash uses at the, at the start of the chapter before? Have you heard that? It's not so much a story. It's more of a joke, actually. Um, so, oh, look, I've I've heard iterations of that kind of yeah, thing, yeah. especially in the last little while, but yeah. not, yeah. So I've yeah. like heard that kind of thing around the traps, where it's yeah. like, dude, I gave you all these things to look after yeah. you, and so the opening, the opening of the chapter is um, a man named Henry uh, in you know uh, freezing cold water in his life, ja- life jacket, clutching onto a, you know, uh, pieces of fiberglass and plastic, like his boat's been ruined. 
um, and praying to God, Lord, save me. And Henry hears God answer, I'm, I'm, I will save you. Um, and then a few minutes later, someone comes by in a boat and says, do you need some help? And Henry says, like, no, no, God will save me. God will save me. Um, and then he drifts further out to sea and uh, another boat comes past and says, do you need help? And he said, no, nah, God's got this. God will save me. And then drifts further and further out to sea, getting colder and colder and sicker and sicker. And a helicopter flies by, drops a rope and says, grab my hand. You know, I'll, I'll get you out of this. And uh, Henry still says, no, nah, it's fine. God's, God's going to save me. And then he dies and meets God face to face and uh, says, I, I trusted you. I believed in you when you said that you'd save me. What, uh, what happened? And God says, I sent two boats and a helicopter, mate. What more do you want? <laughs> um, I really, yeah, I really like that. Have you, Emily, have you, have you encountered that um, theological strain in Christianity that is, you know, expect God. a divine intervention, but yeah. there's things that we are provided with that yeah. are not what we would necessarily con- consider divine intervention. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think a lot of people can get, um, yeah, so, so fixated on those uh, instances and expressions of, you know, divine intervention that, you know, they can just start to ignore or, or think that it's not, it's not our responsibility to get involved with making the world better. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very much with Ash on like this, the arc of scripture shows us that God doesn't act without our cooperation. Mm. God, like um, whether, whether it's by, you know, God's choice to just go, I'm, I'm committed to working with humanity or, you know, whether it's just there, there is no other option. Our involvement is a necessary part of God's saving plan for the world. Mm. Um, God is not a God who is just going to do this, you know, snap fingers that God doesn't have. Um, and like the genie. Gets better. The genie. I dream the genie, genie. Nod, yeah. nod. <laughs> <laughs> Infinite cosmic power, itty bitty living <laughs> space. I'm crossing the streams there. Those are two different genies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I really like that in, as a, as a framing for, you know, Moses stepping into this, this role of leadership because there, you know, there is that God, can't you do this without me? Can't you, or why, why do I why have me? to do this? <laughs> yeah. Why me? Um, and I, it actually, as I was reading this this chapter, it made me think of um, the conversation I had with um, Tando Singamanga in um, Zimbabwe. So I chatted with him for our other podcast, Mission Unplugged, and um, one of the things he talked about was this this sense of, um, you know, if God gives you a vision for something, then that is your mission. If God draws your attention to something, if you notice. It is actually a calling to to get involved. Mm. Um, what that involvement looks like, who knows? But but that if it's grabbed your attention, it's it's probably something that God wants you involved with, which mm. can then be really hard when the things that grab your attention are these big, you know, global, you know, um, World Bank is predicting that global poverty is going to rise for the first time in twenty years. Uh, yeah, it's it's been getting better and better every year for 20 years. And then this year it's getting worse. Um, mm. That's a, that's a big thing to have God draw your attention to. Um, and so many scary. of those things too, they're so big that it's like, where do you even start? And like, yeah. what are the questions you even ask to like, you don't know what you don't know. Therefore you don't know the yeah. questions you need to ask yes. to get in the right places. So much. So yeah. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so let's jump into some of these questions that, uh, Moses gives God, because this is one of my favorite things about, uh, about God. Uh, God is not so big that you can't talk back to God. God is not so big that you can't, 
Yeah, like we said before, you know, that imagining ourselves as as Ash encourages us to do, imagining ourselves as a slave, a character who is a slave in this story, observing this conversation with the burning bush. Mm. Um, you know, this guy Moses is talking back to God. It's a pretty clear sign. It's a pretty clear call, and yet Moses still has the audacity to talk back to God. <laughs> But the fact, um, I think I love that too, though, right? Because having a God that is so personal in that way that it's like no wrestle is too big to like take to God and be like, I don't get this. I'm angry at this. I'm going to yeah. be angry at this. Yeah. And But then like working through some of those things, it's like, I don't understand. This frustrates me. I'm angry about this. But yeah. then being able to work through that with God is so good because it's yeah. like, like it's not too big for it. It's not too little for it either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And to negotiate with God and say, that, oh, oh, we'll, we'll, get, "We'll get to it," but you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to go talk. I'm putting my foot down. I'm not going to go talk to people. And God, goes, fine, <laughs> fine. He's Take someone else with you. Yeah, he's, yeah. He'll do it for you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, your brother yeah. can spin a yarn. He'll do you. He'll be your voice. <laughs> <laughs> So, Which is probably some of the first question. We'll get to that one. Yeah, we'll Don't get to worry that about one. it. We'll get there. We'll get to that one. So the first question that um, Moses asks God is, um, uh, Ash summarizes it, who do, you, who do you think I am to be doing this? Um, so I, w- I wanted to read uh, this section because I quite, I quite like it. And it, does, it dovetails nicely with what we were talking about before. Um, quote, people might think that they would love a personal experience of the God who really knows them inside and out, but often this is a vague, romantic feeling about God, neither biblically authentic nor true to the human experience. Moses certainly did not feel warm fuzzies about God in front of the burning bush. Um, oh, so true. <laughs> um, so here... Um, God has heard the cries of the Hebrew people who were in misery and wanted Moses to free his people from that oppression. This is where Ash talks, takes us through nine main words for oppression that are weaved throughout the Old Testament. Um, uh, why don't I try it? Uh, I don't speak <laughs> Hebrew. Uh, I, have, I don't study any ancient languages. I'm going so, to enjoy watching you try this. Let's just go for it. My sincere apologies to any Hebrew speakers who might be listening in. Um, Anar is the has to do with, and I'm, I'm reading from the book here. Um, the word Anar has to do with the tyranny of the powerful, the degradation of people, and even the violent sexual exploitation of women. Ashak uh, is on the next page. Um, around the exploitation of um, goods, fields, savings, capital, and homes taken in violent and unjust ways without recourse. They're very much drawing on that powerlessness that we were talking about before. Um, oh, lacats, lachats, lacats. It's it's going to be it's have that um, sound, isn't it? Lacats. Uh, is another word for that is translated oppression. Uh, the Egyptians are crushing the Hebrews. God hears their cries and wants to respond uh, by freeing them. This is about a lack of fr- freedom from grinding injustice. Uh, Nagas, uh, the, this word is about forced labor, oppression, and exploitation. Yana, again, this word is about oppression and violence against those who are not in a position to defend themselves. Ratsats, uh, this is crushing, isolating, and despoiling the poor, including stripping, stripping them bare and taking their homes. Uh, Daka, um, in arrogance, the powerful crush God's people, oppressing them, killing the most vulnerable, and falsely believing that God does not see. But God does see and will act. Uh, Duck, it's spelled D-A-K. Where? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> This word is about treading upon the heads of the poor and oppressed and putting down the needy. And talk. Um, this word talk is about the powerful causing violent injury to those who are helpless. 
So there's a lot of nuance there around what this uh, sense of oppression means. Um, but Ash's summary is, uh, quote, Certainly poverty includes destitution and requires finding ways to respond to those who are crushed and down and out. Yet a Hebrew understanding of poverty is much broader than simple destitution. It has to do with depression and the life God intends for those being crushed who are made in God's image. A Hebrew understanding of poverty then is not just about destitution. It is by nature a lack of ability to live as God intends. How does God intend those made in his image to live? God's liberation from oppression for the Hebrew people included the promise that they would live in a land flowing with milk and honey, symbols, as, symbols of a sustainable and joyful life. Poverty, then, is about a lack of freedom to choose God's shalom, to live in a meaningful life. This kind of poverty faces the majority of the planet today and provides a starting point in understanding how we can respond to poverty. This is the definition of poverty that informed Jesus' understanding of his mission to bring good news to the poor, which is from Luke 4, 18 to 19, end quote. Um, so this question of, uh, that Moses poses, this excuse to get in, not to get involved, um, as you have already pointed out, Emily, Ash goes on to talk about how Moses has already been positioned. Um, he, you know, grew up in the palace. He knows Pharaoh personally. Um, he has a connection with his Hebrew uh, relatives, but or uh, his he Hebrew people. Mm. But you know, has these direct connections with those seats and centers of power. Um, and this is something that I. Um, don't tend to think about in this story. Um, quote, you are the only, you Moses are the only one of us who's lived out in the desert and knows how to survive and travel beyond slavery to the new land. That's a really interesting point that something it's I a don't really yeah. niche yeah. piece of knowledge that you wouldn't think about, but yeah. like it's perfect for the context, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, even this, this time spent, fleeing from Pharaoh um, and living in the desert has prepared Moses, has given yeah. Moses these, these skills. So I guess like a question for us is, you know, these times we've been spending in and out of lockdowns and in a pandemic and stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. what, what, what are the skills you picked up through this time that God's is using to hone and prepare mm -hmm. us for whatever that call on our life is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I, that's, that's always been one of my um, favorite things that I like. I like exploring with people when it comes to, you know, mission and justice stuff is, um, you know, you, you are uniquely positioned in this world. There is nobody else in the world who has had the exact set of experiences that you have, the exact set of perspectives and can no one else who can bring that stuff to bear on uh, issues of injustice. Mm. Um, and, you know, some of those things are just going to, are going to bring this really like amazing nuance. Um, and like our communities flourish when we bring these vast diversities together and bring those things to bear together on situations of injustice. Cause together mm. we can cover like, so much stuff, such mm. a broad range of experiences. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess like Ash's point is that like Moses, none of us have, uh, none of us have nothing to bring. Mm. Everyone we all have something. something. Yep. Yep. Mm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, not all of us will be caused to uh, lead, directly lead a slave population out of a empire. And that's okay. That's and good. That's okay. Otherwise, I don't have everyone would be, that. well, you say that, but have you seen a movie? Who knows? Recently? Who knows? <laughs> um, but also, like, not everyone needs to do that either. Like, if everyone was doing that, then we'd all be just travelling around the world trying to get across different borders. Like. Yeah. That's the kind of thing too. Like, 
that there's a point to not everyone having the same call or skills because yeah. we don't need to all have the same yeah. came, same call or skills because yeah. like that would be bad <laughs> <laughs> there's a point for yeah. being diversity in yeah. the body and then yeah, finding absolutely. the unity in that it's like an eye being an eye tried to be a foot or what that's not that's a really bad oh, that's, that's pretty the vibe it. of the thing <laughs> it's pretty much it's it vibe. It's definitely that's the vibe of the thing <laughs> Um, so quote from the, uh, towards the end of this section, as Moses life shows, God wastes no experience in moving us towards this freedom. Everything and anything can be helpful to enable true liberation to be possible for us and through us to others, our pain mistakes, and even our palace experiences or powerless times can be transformed by God to help others. God needs all kinds of people to make our communities and world a better place. Mm. Yeah. So the 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 implied you know the implied answer to who do you think I am is well you're Moses you are yeah. every everything that has gone into Moses um, and you have a lot to offer. Yeah. The next so, question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I'm just curious because this is like just a fun little question. Yeah. So there's a bit where he talks about just sort of um, about being you know God is. Um, I am who I am, mm. um, and then um, a being beyond time and space, yet one who interve- um, who intervenes personally in a human history in an ever-present way. There is no way we humans can tame this being, even if we try to to do so with our, ma- our imaginations. Mm. So the question that like that made me think of, like, yeah. what does in your mind, what does God look like when mm. you like talk about God? What does God look like? Yeah. Yep. Um- <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> How do you imagine question. God? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I can, I, oh, I can give you, I can give you the the nerdy answer. Um, no, let's but, hear all the answers. For, for me, I try really hard not <laughs> not to picture, uh, mm. like not not to put a picture on 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 God the God the Father, the distinct person of the Trinity, um, because God is spirit. God does not have a body. God does not have a face. God is, God is not white flowing robes and a long white beard sitting on a cloud. That's yep. Zeus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, God, yeah, God is not the, the Simpsons God, um, <laughs> the, the only character in that show to have five fingers and five toes. Um, really? Yeah. Yeah, oh. God has five fingers and five toes in The Simpsons, uh, and all yeah. the other characters have four. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> um, but the now the 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 the, the preaching answer uh, mm. is that I picked Jesus mm. because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. I, I I'm I'm quoting badly, but you know through through Jesus, God is made known. Um, and, and so, what does you your know, Jesus look like? You know, brown skin, Middle Eastern, cool, a bit dirty, um, a bit dirty, <laughs> sandals, lo- sandals. Loves the poor, uh, you know, eats meals with people. He's, he's probably got a bit of left, uh, you know, last night's dinner still under his fingernails. Um, yeah. Bit in his beard, know, probably too. Bit in his beard, goes to parties, uh, gets into arguments, gets yep. angry, get, gets, gets hungry and curses a fig tree because there's no food on it because he's a bit hangry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> honestly, one of my favorite stories. <laughs> um, <laughs> And and then and then comes back to it and tr- totally tries to convince everybody that it was a it was a metaphor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so those 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 attributes, those characteristics, um, that's that's God. Um, mm. You know, God. If if Jesus is the the image of the invisible God, then God has to be. To quote um, theologian Trip Fuller, God has to be at least as nice as Jesus. Uh, mm. What about you? I mean, it's probably developed over time because mm. you know it would have been at one point, you know, the Jesus, the the white Jesus, because that's what was in all the kids' storybooks. Yeah. So therefore, that's what I saw as Jesus, and right. that's what I thought he looked like. Brown hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, blue eyes. But um, I remember going to um, like a a lunch thing at someone's place and they were Maori 
And mm. on their wall, they had a picture of Jesus, but it was like a Maori, like Maori Jesus. Yeah. So it was like, oh, that's really interesting. That was sort of the first time I was probably maybe like, I don't know, 11 or 12. Um, but that was probably one of those first times that I re- think, oh, Jesus wasn't white. Uh, um, just because I think it's one of those things you kind of put on. Um, but, yeah, probably same as you. But I think one of the thing in terms of, you know, Middle Eastern probably looked more like Osama bin Laden than anything else, that kind of thing. <laughs> I remember when that was a thing that we are all, like, trying to shock each other, like, oh, my gosh, yeah. did you know Jesus yeah. probably looked more like Osama bin Laden than <laughs> that he did the pictures in our kids' Bibles. Um, but then I think something that I've sort of started engaging with a bit more, probably start of the year, would have been, like, the Chosen TV series. And just as you're saying, yeah. like, Jesus being a friend and that kind of thing, mm. that show really kind of exemplified those sort of human characteristics a bit more than sometimes I think we hear in sermons and stuff because we kind of, mm. it's almost like, and rightfully so, Jesus is put on a pedestal as we should yeah. put him on a pedestal because he's Jesus and God incarnate. But also at the same time, he's also like a friend mm. who is just walking along the road, having a having a laugh with the boys mm. at the the wedding of Cana and dancing and making jokes and things like that as well. So um, Getting a bit annoyed that, at his mum when was his mum's there when he's trying to hang out with his mates. And he's like, go away, mum. It's not go cool. Go away, mum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but then even some other scenes in that show as well, you know, when he yeah. has um, Shabbat at Mary Magdalene's place mm. as well and just there's like that real humility there of like, no, it's your place. You mm. you, um, you do the you do the prayers and that kind of thing. So, mm. um yeah, there are some different sorts of media that have sort of, I don't yeah. know, humanised Jesus in a way that might not have been otherwise humanised, Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And as Melinda points out in the chat, there's, a, there's an image in the book of Revelation of the Son of Man in flowing robes and white hair. Um, and, you know, these, these prophetic images and... All of these things, to you know, to a greater or lesser degree, the the uh, depictions of Jesus in uh, eyes like flames. Thanks, Melinda. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that that scary, triumphant uh, conqueror Jesus. Um, yeah, and these these images have impacts on on how we understand God and how we understand mm. um, Jesus and our place in the world, um, which is. Why Moses' second question to God is, "Who are you?" Um, and there was a there was a chunk here that I wanted to read because I thought it was really fantastic. Um, God God's answer is to um, you know describe God's self as the the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, these mm-hmm. these past uh, patriarchs of um, the Israelite people. Um, and here I'll, I'll quote from um, I'll quote from the book: "The Creator God could not fully answer Moses' question. A Creator, by definition, is other than what the creation is or can even imagine. The Lord is, however, able to communicate with His creation in ways that give a glimpse into His nature." The Lord explained to Moses what he was like by looking back and pointing out where he had intervened and shaped people and events in his nation's history. The Lord then pointed to the present where his heart was breaking over the misery of his people. Mm. He then predicted a future of a new land that would provide everything that they need to live well. The summary name of God then is I am who I am a being beyond time and space, yet one who intervenes personally in human history in an ever-present way. There's no way we humans can tame this being, even if we try and do so with our imagination. Yeah, um, how good. Yeah. And to, to skip a little bit but and continue that, um, God asked Moses to remember his story, and then and this reveals a glimpse of the nature of God, a deep, compassionate God who chose people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be his instruments of mercy for a better future, a God with emotion and pathos who felt deeply in his bones and then responded, a God who took sides against oppression and the perpetrators of this oppression, a God who shaped the world through being present in the people who were open and available to him. Um, which, yeah, is... I I think 
I think I often think about that um that response of God's I'm the the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as as sort of a, a you know approving my credentials kind of thing. Like, you know, mm. you, know, you you've you you know these stories, you actually know who I am. I'm I'm the 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 God that you've heard about. But that really reframes that to be no, this this is not this is not only proving my credentials, but this is descriptive of me. This is mm. describing who I am. I am the God who was present in the stories that you, Moses, most likely would know um, mm. of the, you know, the the places and times that God has intervened in people's lives. Very, very intimately. A lot of those stories of, um, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, mm. um, they're, they're, uh, look, if I can summarize them in a word, they're family squabbles. They're not, they don't tend to be big, you know, world-shaking um stories of the end of oppression like the exodus even mm. they're you know brothers fighting and um people getting into scuffs with each other like yeah mm. but god is present in those spaces and personally they're working them and invested yeah. yeah 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 absolutely and like i even know in my life i can look back and see what god's done and mm. therefore no going forward i can trust him into the future and that's kind of what i see that discussion with Moses is it's like look back and see who I am I am who I am mm. and you know who that is yeah so now trust me going forward because yes. I'm still that same yes. being or I'm still that yes. same god yeah 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 absolutely and there's so much comfort in that mm. Mm. yeah yeah and that um yeah, preaching now but that <laughs> remains yeah. the same god that we today, today, we have, for, today yeah. yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. Yeah. That we have a personal relationship with, mm. uh, you know, mediated by the Spirit, made visible, made known by the by Jesus, and and just come back to that my, one of my favorite quotes. Um, you know, that God is at least as nice as Jesus. Mm. Um, yeah, so good. Um, so the third excuse, the third question that Moses levels at God is still still trying to weasel his way out of uh, uh. taking responsibility for this call. Shout outs, uh, the OG. Um, <laughs> is what will people think? Um, Absolutely. This is much, you know, about those, those relationships that we have with the people around us and how responding to God's call will, will impact that. Mm. Um, <laughs> uh, will will sometimes will the most challenging? Us, yeah, will people think of us as a as a Ned Flanders, a, uh, a <laughs> quote unquote born again nerd? <laughs> yeah, it's really how do they do? How do you how how do no? How I can't do, even think about how it. Do how do you, how do how do they doodly neighbor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's oh, none look, of us. Isn't it? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, our, our third podcast, Emily, is going to be we we watch every episode of The Simpsons where <laughs> Ned Flanders is in it and we talk about them. Uh, we deconstruct yeah. that. Excellent. Good to know. We'll, we'll put that in, the, we'll put that that in the works. That's great. <laughs> Get keen, everyone. <laughs> podcast number three, because two is not enough. <laughs> In this uh, this section of the chapter, um, a lot of Ash's experiences in Thailand starts yeah. start coming out. And this this is probably probably more than um, any of the other questions so far is really embedded. In, or I, I think I think Ash's experience in Thailand gives him more of a perspective than yes. um, than I have living in Australia. So mm. yeah, he talks about how um, Christianity is often in in thailand perceived as a the the westerners religion mm. it's not it's not actually it's not ours it's it's different it's, it's external it's yeah uh, you know the, my word these are my words now you know it's it's colonial it's um it's come in and tried to make itself mm. um prominent here yeah. um, which and, for me just makes me get like yeah, yeah, like, oh, yeah. no 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 yeah. we've done it so yeah. wrong yeah, yeah. <laughs> But then, for those and, people in Thailand who have who have found an experience of of life and peace, and who have experienced mm. God's love and and good news, um, to then join in with that the with the the Westerners' religion, the the white people's religion, um, can mean a, a 
a, a disconnection and a break from family and from mm. community and to become ostracized, to become outcast. I'm positive there is a whole spectrum of experiences there ranging from the, the mild to the really mm. terrifyingly severe. But, mm. you know, that if you are a, a, a new Christian in Thailand, um, you know, in a Thai family, in a slum where you depend on the goodwill of your neighbours for survival every day, um, what are they going to think as I step mm. into this this call that is, um, you know, different than what they expect? Mm. Yeah, so full on. Mm. One of the, on the next page, one of the bits that stood out for me, because it's something I've been thinking about mm. a little bit, um, it says, quote, Jesus wants Aussies to live as God intends us to, and over the next few years, hopefully we can share our unique cultures, customs, and gifts, which will um, in turn shape our common faith and life together, mm. uh, end quote. So I was like, I loved that because what does Aussie faith look like and mm. not just the Western Aussie faith of what's come in through yeah. colonial means, but what does it look like for us to live alongside and work with and partner with our like traditional custodians, our mm. our Indigenous people who have their own expression, own mm. unique way of connecting with mm. God and the Creator mm. through different means. I'm by no means an expert and don't really have anything. Yeah. It's more questions at the moment, so I don't really yeah. to go yeah, to because yeah. I don't. But just what do, what does that look like yeah. to build an authentic Australian faith, or that's not that that's unique to different country within the land we now call Australia? Yeah. Yeah. So what does it look like to be Christian? What what's a what does it mean to be Christian on Darug land or yeah. like Bunjalung land or yeah. wherever else, like yeah. wherever, whatever land you're on at the moment, like what does that look like? And how, how, how do we start those conversations or maybe mm. continue them in some places in mm. a way that's healthy and nurturing and mm. brings life and that reconciliation or that mm. right relationship? Mm. Yeah. So I just, yeah. I really love that. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I th I think one of the one of the best things about the last uh, look, I'm going to pick a number, hundred years. Um, you know, in the revolution, in the revolutions in um, communications technology, you know, uh, cost effective printing, and you know, all this good stuff. The the increase of or the 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 much greater ease with which we can hear voices from the margins and Christians from, you know, um, historically oppressed groups mm. who are, you know, who have, who have found the, the beauty and the, um, the life and the flourishing in God in this, this uh, religion, in this faith, in this tradition mm. um, and are contributing back um you know something that in, in the at the the height of of christian colonialism never would have would have happened you know you have the white missionary you know formally trained or um whatever it is you go into the the church and they preach and the um you know the the native the colonized people sit and receive they don't mm. give back but now we are getting to this point where we have the opportunity to meet much more in the middle, which is I'm excited for. Yes, it's so it's so exciting because that's that's where there's there's so much life. Okay, mm. um, liberation theology is a really good example of that. It's a, a theological strain that's emerged out of um, you know colonized South America primarily, um, and that is just such a powerful and useful theological framework for engaging with the world. Um, you know, imagine how much more is going to come over the next, the end, the next hundred mm. years, two hundred years. Mm. Um, yeah, as as long as we can engage those that that sense of partnership and that that incarnational, or all of us alongside. Mm. It's 
takes us back to, um, you know, Moses asking, who am I? Um, mm. You know, I, I bring a perspective that is formed by who I am. Mm. And the more of those perspectives and the greater diversity that we can hear in that, the richer we all become. Mm. That's really, I've really gone away, gotten away from um, what will people know. think. But, yes, um, I, I, took, I took us there, so no, apologies about that. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> But I guess even in that, to bring it back to what do people, what will people think about that when that's mm. like, that's that's not how we've done church, yeah. and that's not how we do church. Therefore, like, how 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 do you bring, not just bring new voices in and influences, but then how do you bring people along on that journey too, that may not be at that point yet as well. That's like full on too. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. it's not just yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely um the 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 call of god can so often uh you know require us to take a step towards the the edges away from the comfortable mm. center um where you know in, into the spaces where people go where 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 people don't go um mm. you know can can anything good come from Ringwood Station? Um, yeah, that if if God's calling is into those uncomfortable spaces, that's that's going to raise some mm. eyebrows and um, rub people the wrong way. It's it's there's a um, strain of thinking, or you know, a, a bit of cheeky wink, wink kind of joking that says like if you're not frustrating people, then you're probably not following God right. Mm. Uh, if you're not ir- annoying people, if you're not rubbing people the wrong way. Now, a lot of Look. people have latched onto that um, to in to excuse some pretty asshole behaviour. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, you, the, the point is not to offend and rub people the wrong way. The point is to follow God faithfully. Yeah. But sometimes that offending people and rubbing people the wrong way will come from because, that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it does not the other way around. Offending people doesn't make you doesn't mean no, you're following God. Definitely not. <laughs> um couple of uh highlights um from this section of the chapter are, you know dovetailing straight off that quote um God knew what people would think of Moses and yet would not let him off his responsibilities that easily. What people think, true or false, of our faith experience shouldn't matter to us. Doing what's right is what matters. Doing what God wants should matter most. Ultimately, it's to God that we have to give an account of what we have done with our lives. Mm. And the other thing that I wanted to to highlight, the line that I really liked, um, Change or so Ash talks about the um the miraculous signs that God gave Moses, um, you know, his staff becoming a snake, mm. putting his hand into his cloak, came out leprous, put it back in, it was healed. Mm. Um, God can transform miraculously our everyday work tools like crooks, staffs, bodies like hands, and even life sources like blood to be scary warning signs to others that God is serious about this world. Yet, mostly, God chooses not to. If God did this for us at will, we'd probably feel even weirder and less able to convince others. Change actually comes from solidarity with and being alongside God, not what tricks we can do from on high. We Mm. see clearly in the God who becomes flesh and blood and moves into the neighbourhood. Moving along to uh, excuse question four, what skills do I really have for this? Um, this is this is very it tied very closely with uh, Moses' experiences. Of, you know what what is it that has gone into forming Moses as a person in preparation mm. for the call? Um, but here is where Ash picks up that the the very famous. Uh, refusal of the call that Moses gives, which um, I'll quote from how Ash has uh, reproduced it here. Oh, my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow in speech and slow of tongue. Uh, Moses is not a speaker. 
he's not a skilled orator. He's not the person who's going to be able to stand up in Pharaoh's court and deliver that rousing sermon that gets those those amens and that um, you know everyone cheering preachers or if you're in a um churches of christ tradition uh the the sensible nod mm. Mm. that's just we get <laughs> <laughs> I, I love i love having um preachers from more uh verbally active shall we say <laughs> uh more expressive traditions coming <laughs> from the churches of christ churches um who was uh, Tony Campolo came and oh, spoke. Yeah. Uh, and he's he's uh, his home community is a um, a black church in America, um, and yeah, I'm sure we've all seen the stereotype, the you know, stereotypical black church in the in the movies and TV, um, but that that very active, you know, the amens and mm. the the and preach it's all of that, and uh, Tony's trying to get his. Uh, <laughs> Uh, very white, very middle class churches of Christ church to give more than a sensible nod. And I'm sitting there going, no, Tony, you're doing well. Everyone here is on board. Like, <laughs> oh, so good. No, the bit that um, I loved in this because I think it is so important that we do develop our skills and our like yeah. understand what our as we grow and learn like what our gifts are and yeah. honing them and you know different times we're going to be pushing into places to learn other things and but just being the aware of that self-awareness and examination of the mm-hmm. self to really like press into that stuff because yep. um it's so easy to just go out and be like i want to go and do that thing but you're not mm. skilled or equipped yep. for it and yeah and there's that tension between like holding back and then the god doesn't call the equipped he equips the call that little saying yeah and look there's a place for that i have that written in my notes as well (laughs) (laughs) it's like i get there's a place for that but also there's a tension between that and also like i'm just like blatantly not going to be good at that (laughs) and there's no way i'm ever going to be good at that so i should go no that's okay that i can't do that yeah yeah um that that uh that uh, proverb that God doesn't call the equipped; He equips the called. Um, there, there really is, as you say, there is a real truth in um, stepping into places of calling and trusting that through experience and experimentation, mm. skill will develop, uh, confidence will develop. And this is this is true. Like no one, no one steps into something for the first time a hundred percent. I'm going to smack people do yeah. actually, and those people tend to suck. Um, <laughs> A little bit of humility goes a long way. It's true. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Having a real, as you say, that that real strong sense of of introspection, knowing what you're what you're good at, and mm. and consequently what you're not good at, is mm. is really healthy. Um, Without being like self bashing and being no, like, yeah, I am bad, so yeah. I can't do this thing. But yeah. like going, well, that's not a strength, and that's okay. Yeah. Like that's someone else's job. Yeah, exactly. But yet yeah, there there is this uh, you know I've I've experienced and I've seen it in lots of people people have this capacity to rise to okay rise to the occasion rise to the mm. call um, and you know you, people discover things about themselves that um, yeah they never would have realized. Mm. There's another whole category of things that, for example. If I thought if I came to you and said, Emily, I'm really feeling called by God to um, travel to a remote community and set myself up oh, as a heart wait. surgeon. Oh, we're gonna no, go now. I gotta go. Okay, cool. Let's I really, go. I really yeah, think yeah. I'd be cool. I really think I'd be a really good heart surgeon. Um, Excellent. I wasn't gonna no. go there, but I'm glad you've gone there. Yeah, cool. Yes, exactly right. I'm not a heart surgeon. I'm not qualified. I do not have that skill. <laughs> There's a level of God equipment will that is not needed me. to be able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> God will not equip me in the process of that call by me going somewhere, setting up a heart surgery and rummaging around in people's chests. I can probably figure it out. How hard can it be? Oh, no. (laughs) Now, all that said, if I really did feel a call that like, no, uh, there is a community out there that needs heart surgeons. Um, I have avenues to become a heart surgeon. Yes. I personally Mitchell, individual human being, do not have avenues to become a heart surgeon. That is not going to happen. I'm not that kind of smart. 
Um, I don't have steady hands for one thing. I can't, I can't paint. Uh, like, yeah, I, I tried painting miniatures as a uh, teenager. I just don't have the, the fine motor control for it. Um, I'm reasonably confident that that's not going to happen. Yeah, right. So that's like part of my story, right? Like, so yeah. I have always sort of like, I want to do humanitarian development kind of world stuff. And then, you know, by the time I'm like year 11 and 12, I was like, I'm going to go do physio. Oh, no, year 10. It was like, I'm going to be a physiotherapist. And then it was like looking at ATARs. And then just the thought of having to do anatomy and physiology at uni yeah. was just, I was like, I don't want to memorize all that stuff. But <laughs> in terms of like equipment and stuff, social science, then humanitarian yeah. development, like I looked at all my subjects in hindsight, like, line up perfectly with this kind of stuff but then even in terms of like you know i could have dropped out in year 10 and gone and like been a missionary or done a mission trip or whatever and like but the fact that i chose to like exactly the same avenues that then equip you in certain ways it's part of that working into that calling is like okay i'm going to do this because that is learning this skill and honing this thing to be able to then have a better understanding and um, appreciation and education for yeah. being able to work in this area because like I can't take my education for granted just because mm-hmm. like I could drop out and go and do stuff like yeah. what that's at 16 or 17 like that's dumb like yeah. could do that but like that's taking for granted something that so many people would really want and appreciate yeah and just because I've got the privilege to be able to do that, <laughs> therefore I should, um, which obviously I didn't do. Um, and, yeah, and it's worked out so far. So extreme examples aside, I think Ash <laughs> is onto something really, really key here um, mm. that, that's shown time and time again through through scripture and also just through the experiences of, of people I know and I'm sure people you know, Emily, mm. um, that people do grow into callings. Um, mm, and, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things Ash talks about towards the end of this section is, you know, um, a lot of people want to be able to, you know, um, know that they're going to be able to do something really well before they get into it. Oh, I've just realized that this, I'm talking about me and pottery. I <laughs> hate, this is a side note. I hate <laughs> pottery. I hate it. Um, the number of times I have being led and myself led, you know, hands-on, tactile, acti- reflective activities at church involving clay, you know, <laughs> make, make, make whatever God's leading to, you know. I've led people in that and just, like, not done it because I can't stand clay. It is it the texture the or is no, it like? No, it's, I know what it is. It's because I think I should be able to do it and I can't. Yeah. I can I can see the thing. You can picture the thing that you want to make you I can picture it just the little doesn't come out of your hands. I can't make my fingers do it. What? I did that. It frustrates me. And is, <laughs> this is one of the, uh, you know, this is, this is me bearing my soul on the, uh, on the Discord and the podcast now. <laughs> it's one of the things that really triggers my, um, my ego and my sense of, um, you know, confidence because I really feel like I should be able to do it and I just – can't i'm i'm um, right now googling pottery for dummies and getting it for you for christmas thank you thank You're you welcome. um with a with a copy of the soundtrack from ghost please <laughs> <laughs> no you just need unchained melody <laughs> um <laughs> anyway people want to be like me People can, people can, Ash is saying that people can want to be like me. They want to know that they're going to be able to nail it the first time. They're going to be able to step into that space confidently and with everything all lined up. And it's just not the reality. Um, and Ash wonders. It's very humbling as you learn that as well through yeah, experience. Yeah. I think we can kind of know that, but then you kind of go, nah, nah, I'm going to be that one. Yeah. But then obviously yeah. not. Yeah. And then you learn that anyway. Yeah. And Ash writes, quote, uh, I wonder how many people do not get involved with the suffering of others because they want the grace ticket, which is Ash's way of talking about, uh, he's, he's quoting someone else talking about, you know, having those things ready, being ready for a situation. Um, how many people don't get involved with the suffering of others because they want the grace ticket in advance? I can't speak well enough or I can't do anything about that or I don't have an heart, enough of a heart for those people. 
become, become the basic assumptions rather than the grace of God, which provide, end quote, which then provides what mm. is needed in that situation. That's challenge. That's challenging. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think one of the key things I always try and remind myself, and I think it's, um, it's, it's visible in Ash's story and the story of Urban Neighbours of Hope being present and being committed mm. to being present and being mm. committed to being present and not coming with all the answers, but being able to be a neighbour is sometimes as much as we can do and also is sometimes exactly what's needed. Yes, yeah. and you don't need to be doing all the things all the time to solve no. all the problems. Yeah, that way. But like once again, that's out. one of those things that can be such like can be used as a cop out too. Yes. Yeah. Which I think leads us lovely, beautifully into question five. Just... Surely someone else can do this. Surely someone. Surely else Surely it's not me. Surely it's someone else. Which, in the context of Moses's story, becomes um, Aaron, and it comes back to that that negotiation with God that we were talking about earlier. Um, where Moses sticks to his guns on this one and says, "It's it's not happening. I'm I'm not I'm not doing that public speaking assignment. Um, you know, give me give me a group work assignment instead. I can ride on the coattails um, of everyone else. Exactly. <laughs> but, oh goodness." Moses is <laughs> that guy at uni. Uh, <laughs> that is patently not true based on the rest of Moses' story, as we know. But that's right. so, yeah, Mo, uh, Ash, Ash writes, um, Christians in the world today whisper in their hearts, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Despite signs, wonders, and promises given by the Lord, Moses wanted someone else to get involved. Moses wanted to raise his young family, keep working, and live as normal a life as possible. While this excuse is a rational one, of course there are other people God could have raised up. It was this excuse that got the strongest reaction from the Lord. This, I, I, I think this is one of the sections that had the most highlights from when I first read this in 2010. Mm. Um, it's a slightly different color yellow. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep reading from Ash. The text actually says the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. This was to have long-term tangible consequences for Moses. The Lord was not some kind of super machine to be switched on and off. Rather, the Lord revealed a deep passion, expressing deep feelings about the detachment of his people and Moses. This is the bit that I highlighted in 2010. The Lord was deeply hurt and his frustration mm. boiled over. Do anything, this text seems to say, but don't take God's patience for granted. That, the, the reason that stood out to me in 2010, the reason it still does, um, is that's often not how we think about God. Um, mm. God, God being God being perfect means God is endlessly patient. Uh, you know, um, God is just happy to just you know sit by the door and just gently knock until you you decide to open up. And um, you know, if it takes a day or if it takes twenty years, and I'm sure all of us have had experiences where that has been how God has operated. But I think this is this is. This really captures something where mm. that is really important to remember that God is affected by injustice and oppression and poverty. This this stuff hurts God because God is in among it, experiencing it alongside. Um, Maybe the greatest injustice of the Bible is Jesus dying on the cross, and that's the point where he turns his face away. Right? You kill God. That's, <laughs> that turns out that's bad. Not yeah, and, and God. that's when God turns his face away. It's like, my father, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. 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 And yeah. And like the yeah, hurt. It, yeah. 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 And that that experience of but but even in that moment where God turns God's face away, God is still present in that moment because mm. Jesus is in that moment. Jesus mm. is experiencing one of history's top 10 worst ways to die. Um, pretty bad. Yeah. Um, and is experience, you know, the, the full weight of the grinding machine of empire falls on God mm. in that moment in Jesus. And 
and Jesus experiences every moment. Yeah, that yeah, and feels that that hurt. Mm. Um, and I I think something. Uh, yeah, I I get nervous to say uh, you know God is hurt by poverty because that that can kind of feel like oh well, I, well if I'm not doing everything right now to you know alleviate or I'm I'm hurting God and I'm terrible and da 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 and like God will you know God will give up on me um, you know we see in Moses story God never gives up on Moses mm-hmm. um, but. Yeah, God. God never stops loving Moses. God's mm. love for Moses is in no way reduced. God's patience, and in a way, God's trust in Moses in that moment is reduced yeah. and affected. And Moses spends the rest of his life trying to reclaim that. You know, this this is mm. this is a this is a moment of um of harm to the relationship with God, and it is in no way affects God's love for Moses. Mm. But there is then there is a process of working back to right relationship. Moses mm. growing in himself back into right relationship with God here. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, and then, as we said before, God's response to that negotiation and to the the, the constant pushback of I, I can't do this. I'm not equipped. I'm not the right person. Well, here. Your your Take brother Aaron. Aaron, yeah. Take a Aaron, a Aaron, and and Aaron becomes a partner in this this saving mission alongside Moses and alongside God. Mm. Um, One of the notes I made mm. on this chat on this section was sometimes you just need to put your big big your, hang on. Sometimes you just need to put on your big kid pants and get it put your big kid pants on and get it done, yeah. <laughs> even yeah. when you don't want to. Yeah, and yeah, sometimes yeah. you just need to step up. And um, that's this bit fully. Yeah, yeah. 100%. It's not always fun having to put your big kid pants on. No, no. Um, especially when, as as Moses does, you you genuinely do believe that there are other people out there who could be doing this this better. Absolutely, but, you know, but here you to, are. Yep, yeah. and back to the the um the idea that Tando gave us in that episode of Mission Unplugged. Yeah, if it's if it's your vision, it's your mission. Mm. Um, yeah, if God's calling your attention to it, um, you are expected. You are expected to do something about it. Mm. Um, I think the partnership with Aaron is one of probably the the best things about um, you know Moses' story, particularly using it as a leadership example. That that sense of acknowledging that Moses can't do it by himself. Mm. And that you know there are other people with complementary skills that can be drawn on to mm. um, yeah to help shore up those parts of us that are you know are not strong as skill gaps or things that we have yet to grow into but but will here I've got this from from the last part of this little section um, should we uh, should we look for others yes we should and there are probably people like Aaron. We already know. We know already who can go on the journey with us. There are people we can contact. There are people we who can bring to the table things that we cannot. The role of sister churches or partner churches uh, helps here, providing cash or support. However, Moses' interaction with God teaches us that we can't avoid playing our own part. We can't wait for others to do it for us, lest the anger of the Lord is kindled against us too. From here, the rest of the the chapter is uh, takes on a very it takes on a reflective tone. We've got our framework of those five questions, and um, you know, Ash takes us through um, how do these affect our own responses to poverty and to injustice. Um, you know, which which of these questions resonate with us and um, shape our response when we see poverty and injustice in the world. Um, Emily, which of those questions resonated with you? I think the two that I've probably wrestled with most, um, probably in the last couple of years, has been surely there's someone else or Mm. do I really have the skills? Mm. Um, And they're probably still 
continual wrestles in certain areas. Um, but, yeah, they're definitely the two that I don't think I could pick one or the other because I think, for me, they're somewhat combined. 100%. Um, what about you? Yeah, very similar. I think um, I think can't someone else do it is also something that I uh, yeah I'm I'm a I'm a perpetual um, workaholic. I'm the 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 person who's on every role in the Sunday church roster. Uh, you know, twice in one week kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> even at a church that only does one service per week. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's that's always that's always been my vibe, and yeah, um, that's I, and I love I love doing that. That's that's how I express my my commitment to the 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 life that mm-hmm. we have together as a church. But you know, there are those moments where you you just get really stretched, and it can feel like you're the only one doing anything, or the only one who cares, who or the cares, only one who yeah. sees the yeah. problems. Yeah, um, and and then. You know, can't someone else do it becomes a different kind of thing as well, where um it's it's not just I don't want to do it. It's like where where are the other people? Why why is this mm. always falling to me kind of thing? Mm. Um and that can become just as just as much of a block and just go, no, I'm not I'm not gonna do this because can't someone else should someone else should do it. someone else yeah. should step up yeah um yeah yeah there's there's a healthy version of that there's a there's a boundary setting version of that and there's a avoiding burnout version of that <laughs> what's that um and then there's a really unhealthy version of that that is mm. resentful and petty and mm. small and i don't like in myself so mm. yeah so that's chapter one of uh, yeah. Make Poverty Personal. Um, that before... was a big and guys. So congratulations for sticking it out. We've gone it out with us. A little bit to... longer than we were aiming to, but we yeah. also did kind of cover the intro and set the scene and stuff. Uh, yes. So... so next week, next fortnight, we'll aim for a little bit shorter. Yep. Yep. And we'll be reading uh, chapter two, Hebrew laws and, quote, always having, end quote, poverty. Um, yeah, I'm keen to look into a bit of that. So, Emily, to wrap us up, uh, what are you going to continue to wrestle with from this chapter? Oh, look, I just, I just think um, probably continually um, sitting in some of those questions um, and some of that self-reflection stuff and... Um, maybe learning or practicing and putting into practice when I need some errands in my world yeah. um, and having the courage to let some of some stuff, letting, letting stuff go in a healthy way that allows mm. people then to go into their own mission and their own um, mm. area of stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think for me, mm. I think the thing that's going to stick with me and continue rattling around in my head is that, um, uh, yeah, uh, those those images of God that we've we've talked about, and how those really shape who we understand God to be, and and consequently how we understand ourselves and our our response and our partnership and involvement with God. Um, yeah, who who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Um, mm. I mean, that's yeah, isn't that isn't that the fundamental qu- question of faith? Mm. <laughs> so. To send us out, uh, Emily, would you? You've got a benediction for us. I do have a benediction. So um, this is a French Francescan benediction, and um, I'll stick a copy of it in the reading mission uh, chat, so you can see that you can read it again and meditate on it, or do whatever you do if you would like to. Um, and yeah, let's spend some time in prayer as we send ourselves off into our weeks. May God bless you with a restless discomfort about easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may seek truth boldly and love deeply within your heart. May God bless you with a holy anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people, so that you may tirelessly work for justice, freedom, and peace among all people. May God bless you with the gift of tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, or the loss of all that they cherish, 
so that you may reach out your hand and comfort them and transform their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can really make a difference in this world so that you do, so that you are able with God's grace to do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to Reading Mission, a podcast by Embody. If you enjoyed this conversation, please rate and review us so more people can find us. And make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. Every episode of Reading Mission is recorded live in our Discord server. So if you want to join in the live discussion and connect with other people exploring mission, justice, and social change together, head to embody.org.au slash discord to join in. Embody is a national community of young people passionate about mission locally, nationally, and globally. You can find us on Instagram and Facebook at embodyau and visit our website at embody.org.au. All the links are in the show notes. Embody is part of the Global Mission Partners family. We respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of lands and waters of Australia and pay respects to elders past and present. We recognise their continuing connections to land, water and culture. Music in the show is by Josh Woodman. We'll catch you next time and thanks for listening to Reading Mission.